I know there are people still checking in, but we'd like to keep everything on time because we know in the middle of the day, everybody has very busy schedules. So good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mary Kane, and I am the director of the National Museum of American Diplomacy. And I am delighted to be here today to, um, to open Heroes of US Diplomacy event at the museum, the first and only museum dedicated to telling the story of the history, practice, and challenges of American diplomacy. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all here. And I love this crowd. It's a beautiful crowd. This is the fourth event in the Heroes series designed to shine a light on Department of State professionals who have exhibited sound policy judgment as well as intellectual, physical, and moral courage in their service, thereby advancing the mission of the department and elevating US diplomacy. Today, we recognize an icon and pioneer from our department's rich history, Dr. Ralph J. Bunch. Today's panel and paired exhibit in the museum illuminates the impact he had on the practice of diplomacy and highlights his international and domestic historic contributions. In addition to the exhibit upstairs, I'd like to invite you when you get a chance after the panel to come up here and look at the artifacts in the room, including a replica of Dr. Bunch's Nobel Peace Prize on loan to us courtesy of Mr. Ralph Bunch III, one of today's panelists. We are also thrilled to be able to display Dr. Bunch's UN beret and armband generously donated to us by the Ralph Bunch Institute for International Studies at the Graduate Center, City University of New York. We thank Dr. John Torpy, the director of the institute who is in the audience today, and his staff for the donation and the items on loan upstairs. Yes. Another generous donation is on display downstairs today, framed Dr. Bunch commemorative stamps and a program celebrating the 100th anniversary of his birth, given to the museum by one of our board members, Mr. Jim Dandridge. Yes. But Jim is one of our special folks because he serves also as the vice chairman of the Diplomacy Center Foundation, which is the 501c3 organization that supports the museum. I'd like to recognize the Foreign Service Institute and fellow members of the Heroes of US Diplomacy Steering Committee for their role in developing this initiative and organizing today's event with museum staff, as well as the Una Chapman Cox Foundation for its generous support. Thank you very much. I'd also like to acknowledge the Office of the Historian, the nominators for Dr. Bunch, for their expertise, as well as the State Department's Ralph Bunch Library for their contributions to today's program. Thank you. And for more information on this initiative, please visit their website at www.state.gov, Heroes of Diplomacy. And I'd li also like to encourage State Department personnel to continue nominating your colleagues for the current day Heroes Among Us category. And now I have the distinct pleasure to introduce our moderator for this afternoon, Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield. Yes. <laughs> Ambassador Thomas Greenfield retired from the Foreign Service in 2017 after a distinguished 35 year career. She is currently the inaugural Distinguished Resident Fellow in African Studies at the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown University. From 2013 to 2017, she served as the Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of African Affairs. And prior to this appointment, she served as Director General of the Foreign Service and Director of Human Resources, as well as Ambassador to Liberia from 2008 to 2012. She's had numerous overseas postings, including the US mission to the UN, similar to our honoree. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Madam Ambassador. Good. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Wow, it's great to see such a, a large audience out here. Uh, thank you, Mary, for the introduction. And I have to say, I'm just delighted uh, to be here and to moderate what I can promise you will be a compelling and illuminating discussion on the diplomat and the activist, Dr. Ralph Bunch. Uh, like many of you, I've seen his name across the department's uh, library. I visited the Ralph Bunch Center at Howard University. And I am 
pleased that I have shared some similar portfolios through my work at the U.S. Mission to the United Nations, as well as our common interest in African affairs. And for me, uh, as for all of you, uh, he really uh, was and remains a giant in the uh, diplomatic arena that we all should aspire to uh, become. In conversations with uh, today's panelists, I learned another interesting personal connection. Uh, after Dr. Bunch started climbing the ranks at the UN, the State Department tried to take, take him back and appoint him as U.S. Ambassador to Liberia, where I eventually would uh, become ambassador many decades later. And Ralph, uh, the son, I'm happy he didn't do that because it would have been really big shoes uh, <laughs> to follow if, if he had done that. Uh, so. Uh, I thank him uh, belatedly for giving me the opportunity uh, to uh, be ambassador to Liberia and not have to compete with his legacy. <laughs> and although uh, he declined that for reasons we'll get into during today's panel, his connection to Liberia endured in many ways. And in fact, I even uh, met Ralph in, in Liberia, uh, his grandson, uh, who carries that big name. and. Uh, has to fill those big shoes instead of me having to fill it as, as ambassador. Uh, but he was there in 2008 when I came out there as um, ambassador. Uh, Dr. Bunch was a pioneer in every sense. The first African American to hold a doctorate in political science uh, from an American institution. First African American desk officer at the State Department. First African American to win the Nobel Peace Prize. But beyond these labels and identity markers, Dr. Bunch is an exemplar, not only for his contributions domestically to civil rights, but also because of his contributions as a diplomat and advocate for international diplomacy. Our panelists will discuss today how his desire for liberation of and peace for peoples abroad was intrinsically tied to his, his desire for that on the home front as well and in both places he made a great name for himself. So today, join me in uh, welcoming three panelists. I'll introduce each of them individually and allow them to speak. Uh, and then we'll, uh, and I'll ask uh, a couple of questions of each of them and then we'll open uh, it up for, for the audience. Our first panelist to my left is Dr. Rastiala. Dr. Uh, Robbie Perry uh, next to him, and Raf Bunch III uh, at the far end. Dr. Rastiala is Professor of Comparative and International Law at UCLA School of Law and the Director of UCLA's Ronald W. Bur Burkle Center for International Relations. UCLA is also home to many of Dr. Bunch's papers and archives as their Bunch Center uh, at their Bunch Center, and I understand that Dr. Rastiala is currently writing a book on Dr. Bunch. Today, he will discuss Dr. Bunch's contributions to international diplomacy, as well as career highlights from the time that he served at the State Department and the UN. May I turn it over to you? Yes, thank you so much. I really want to thank the State Department for doing this, and it's a great honor to be here. So I'll just say a few words about uh, Dr. Bunch's overall career as a diplomat and I focus a little bit on the State Department, uh, though obviously he spent most of his time in the United Nations. So from about 1947 uh, until his death in 1971, uh, he was most strongly associated with the UN, though as mentioned, he was often drawn back to Washington. Uh, encouraged to come back. He never accepted those positions. He did, he did visit D.C. frequently uh, at quite high levels. Uh, so, for example, during the Vietnam War, uh, he came to the White House, met with Lyndon Johnson, uh, and in various other times spoke with President Kennedy, Truman, Eisenhower, etc. So uh, throughout his career, he was always very close to the highest levels of American foreign policy, uh, but he resisted uh, those uh, entreaties to come back. So I'll say a word about, uh, I think, what his major contributions were uh, throughout his life as a diplomat. Uh, and I'll start with the issue that really captivated him uh, from the very beginning, not only at UCLA, where he was an undergraduate, but also at Harvard, where he did his PhD, which was the issue of colonialism. And that was something that he, he wrote his dissertation on. When he came uh, into the US government, he began as an expert on Africa. At that time, the State Department had no Africa uh, unit. 
Uh, and in fact, he began in the OSS, uh, then came over, was sort of seconded to the State Department, and during the war effort, focused on issues related to the conflict in Africa. But there were very few people with any expertise in Africa at all. But his focus had always been on colonialism. And so when he's in the State Department, he works directly on issues of creating what's now known as the Trusteeship Council within the UN with a vision towards unraveling the empires that still were quite dominant in the 1940s. So that's issue number one. I'll mention three issues that he worked on that I think really uh, were at the core of his professional identity. That's issue number one, his international identity. Uh, number two, peacekeeping. He was one of the early developers of the UN doctrine of peacekeeping. So once he enters the UN, the UN keeps trying to get him. I'll just step back for a second. The UN keeps trying to get him to join in the early years. Eventually, he, there's a letter over there where he's, uh, one of his friends is writing about whether he should accept the position. And he does accept the position at the UN, at the time thinking it's going to be short term and that he would probably return to academia. And he is offered various positions. Howard always wants him back. Harvard offers him a position at some point. He never takes those positions. He stays in the UN. But his notion was it was short term. But early on, he gets involved in peacekeeping, and he develops a lot of the doctrines that we associate with UN peacekeeping today. One of the most interesting examples being his time in 1960 in Congo. So as Congo, uh, as some of you know, 1960, uh, we're now in the 50th anniversary, 60th, not 70, I can't, I'm losing track of my math. Big anniversary uh, for that. Uh, often known as the Year of Africa because 17 African states gained their independence, Congo being the most uh, in many ways the most significant and the most fraught. Ralph Bunch is there on the ground in the Congo on the day of independence. And as Congo begins to unravel very, very quickly uh, with secessionist movements, uh, internal battles, and conflicts between Belgians who are still there uh, and Congolese forces and political leaders, he's there uh, leading the UN effort to keep the conflict under wraps and ultimately to introduce peacekeeping forces uh, in Congo. Third issue, and the one that he's probably most famous for, is mediation. So the Nobel Prize that was mentioned, that's sitting over there, was the result of his quite successful, uh, limited of course, because we're still in this conflict, but quite successful at the time, mediation uh, between the young Israeli state that had just declared independence the year before, this is in 1949, uh, and the various Arab states surrounding. And so uh, on the island of Rhodes, uh, he takes over the mantle of mediator uh, from the original mediator who was assassinated uh, in Jerusalem uh, just months before, and he manages to hammer out a series of deals with Jordan, Egypt, Syria, et cetera, that lead to armistice uh, agreements that enable a larger peace process to take place. And for that effort, he receives the Nobel Prize. Throughout the remainder of his career, that defined uh, First of all, his role in the public consciousness, that's one of the things that made him incredibly famous. Um, but two, also defined the way he thought about the purposes of diplomacy. He was very much a peacemaker. He believed that peace was possible between nations. He often said there are no, I'm gonna butcher this phrase, but basically there are no warlike peoples, only warlike leaders. And that you could achieve peace if you, if you worked at it and found ways to, uh, to unearth compromise. And he did that very, very effectively in Rhodes. Um, so those three things really defined his career at the UN, but they started with his career here at the State Department when he was trying to develop not only what became the UN Charter, but also the understanding of what was American foreign policy towards the liberation of the many, many places on Earth that were still ruled uh, by other empires. And that was a lifelong passion that connected to his, not only to his professional work at the UN, but to his civil rights work. So maybe I'll just stop there. Good, well thank you very much. Look, let me start with um, uh, a question uh, to you that uh, I think would be of interest to, to our audience. Uh, you talked uh, a bit about uh, his work at the UN. You mentioned his work at the State Department. But we'd be curious to hear from you a bit more on uh, his career at the State Department. I don't know if we can call it a career. It wasn't there that it was long. It was brief. Uh, but his career as a desk officer focusing, focusing on African uh, issues. Can you shed a bit of light on this portion of his career and what uh, surprised you there? Sure. So, so as I mentioned, when he first goes into the U.S. government, it's as part of the OSS, the precursor to the CIA, as we now 
as we now know it. And so his initial efforts uh, really were around very basic issues like uh, American troops are going to be deployed in Africa. What do they need to know? Again, we had very little expertise in the U.S. government at this time. What do they need to know? He actually develops a manual that's given to troops that they could carry with them. Mm -hmm. And so he's doing some very um, you know, concrete and important things during the war effort. Then as he moves over into state, and he formally kind of enters a position here at state, at that time the war effort is becoming more clear that we are going to be victorious. And very early on, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is already discussing uh, with Churchill and then with Stalin about some kind of organization uh, that would come at the end of the war. So they were planning, even as early as I think 1942, they are thinking about this, knowing that, that we will be ultimately the victors and we need something. Many people don't realize the League of Nations is still in existence at this point. In fact, the League doesn't end until 1946. But everyone knows the League is a disaster. We need something better, something different. And so Ralph Bunch becomes a part of the group. He gets put into that, uh, that wing of state which is planning for the post-war peace and planning for a new international organization. And so he starts going to conferences. He starts meeting people from around the world. He builds up a network that actually then carries through uh, to his UN career, but of, of young leaders, uh, or sometimes not so young leaders, from the other major states, but also from some, some newly independent states, uh, all with an aim to thinking about what does this UN organization look like. Uh, and they're already using the phrase UN at this point because that was what the Allies called themselves, the, the United Nations. So that was the name, and so the idea was the organization would take that on. Um, so he was really critical. So he doesn't go to, uh, there's a couple of famous conferences that take place to plan the UN. Dumbarton Oaks was the location. As far as I could tell, he's not in Dumbarton Oaks, though he was obviously very close by, mm -hmm. uh, mostly because the trusteeship issues, the colonial issues that he cared about were getting sidelined uh, by uh, the kind of national security side of things particularly with regard to the islands in the Pacific that we had been recapturing. The Navy did not want to give those back, even though they had often been colonies of Germany or Japan. The Navy said, no, 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 we're not giving those back. And so last thing I'll say on this is he's part of a, of a process to figure out how do we square the circle? How can the U.S. live up to its, its ideals of being an anti-colonial uh, nation, at least an ideal, not always a reality, but that's the ideal that we had. Uh, fighting against the British in particular who said we want to keep our empire. And so they come up with the idea of strategic uh, trust territories that would be under the control of the Security Council and that includes many of these islands. So he's part of that team that's thinking this through and in San Francisco comes up with a solution that ends up in the charter. So again, colonialism and how to unravel it was always on his mind. Okay. You, you described him as a negotiator and a diplomat and when we spoke uh, uh, as we were preparing for this program, you noted that he transcended race and he became very much a, a public figure. Can you tell us what you mean by that and give us some examples? Sure. So after his Nobel Prize, so actually even before his Nobel Prize, he starts to realize that he's become a little bit famous. The world is focused on bit. what's going to happen. <laughs> what's going to happen in this in this conflict between uh, uh, Israel and all the other Arab states. And as he's leaving the Middle East to go back, and again, he has not received the prize at this point, he starts to get noticed in the street sometimes. And uh, you know, he realizes, okay, people are following this story. And he goes back to New York at one point during the negotiations, and he's buying something in a shop in Manhattan. Uh, and the shopkeeper uh, says, uh, oh, you're going to give away the Negev Desert, aren't you? To him, he's like, "Wow, you you really are following this this story." Uh, so he realizes, okay, people are really paying attention to this, and then he receives the prize, and everything changes for him. And so uh, I'll give kind of a couple of vignettes. So one is uh, the 1950 Academy Awards. So in the 1950 Academy Awards, the Best Picture award is always the last, and so Fred Astaire is the host. And he comes on stage and he says, for the next award, I'm going to bring up uh, someone who's not of our industry, but is kind of a hometown favorite. And up walks Ralph Bunch. And Ralph Bunch comes on stage, gives a little speech. Uh, he talks about the United Nations, the importance of democracy, the importance of film as he, he always 
he was very scrupulous about being an international civil servant, but he was an American first and foremost, and he often saw and said that the United States was a model for the kind of multicultural, multiracial world we were entering. And so he talked about the film industry as a kind of vehicle for the kind of democracy that needed to be exported worldwide. And then at the end of his speech, everybody listens kind of respectfully, at the end of his speech, he gets to the point that they really care about, which is who's gonna win Best Picture, and he hands the Best Picture award to Daryl Zanuck for All About Eve. So what I love about that story, and you can find this on YouTube, it wasn't, in those days the Academy Award wasn't broadcast, but there was a kind of internal film, is the kind of celebrity that he had. So the idea that someone from the United Nations, frankly someone mm -hmm. from the State Department, would be on stage today at the Academy Awards, unthinkable. <laughs> so it was a different era. And, and he, that was the kind, of, uh, the kind of fame that he had. And so in the years and months to come, he had a ticker tape parade down Broadway. Uh, he gives innumerable speeches. He's invited everywhere. Uh, and um, he's really someone who's in the public mind in a way that's, uh, I think, hard to imagine today for either, again, a State Department official or a UN diplomat. And he used that. He used that to speak out on things that he really cared about. Well, thank you, Carl. That was extraordinarily interesting. Now let me uh, turn to Dr. Ravi Perry. Dr. Perry is the chair of Howard University's Department of Political Science, the same department Dr. Ralph Bunch founded in 1928. So you had to step in those big shoes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Perry will discuss Dr. Bunch's domestic civil rights accomplishments and his leadership and how his expertise in, as a political science ga scientist gave him a, a platform for his global work. Thank you, Ambassador. It really is an honor to be here. And yes, that heavy weight of responsibility, uh, I feel every single day at the Mecca. Um, uh, but because the shoes are too big to fill uh, and uh, the legacy is, of course, too grand uh, uh, to not retell every day. And so I want to talk a little bit about uh, his role as a political scientist and how for him uh, that uh, degree and that uh, experience as an academician and as he labeled himself as a social scientist really was the background that gave him the tools to do everything else that he is now famous for. Um, he, I will say a little bit of a, a, a personal note. Uh, he spent a few uh, years in Toledo, Ohio, uh, which is, is not written about much after being born in Detroit and uh, going to Toledo with his father's the last time he lived there. I'm from Toledo, uh, and I will say that we need to find something there to recognize him because there's not a recognition there. Um, and then, of course, he moved on to Albuquerque and then on to L.A. Uh, and it was in at L.A., uh, at UCLA, where he really began to uh, come into his own uh, as a uh, black American and as a, someone with, as a, with black identity, but doing so in a very metropolitan, uh, uh, multi-ethnic context. And so his, his coming to his own in, in his late teen years uh, um, really was influenced by the experience he had at UCLA, which of course where he graduated from valedictorian uh, and uh, gave a wonderful uh, commencement speech uh, as a result of that. He then uh, went on and uh, he later, um, of course, became, as it was, was uh, emphasized earlier, the first African American to get a PhD in political science uh, from an American university. Um, and that, that's something that is significant. Uh, we still do not have enough black political scientists today, uh, and it is such an honor that he, of course, uh, was the first. He would probably be somewhat disappointed with the few number of us that are uh, here today. And he then, uh, of course, became very famous uh, as a political scientist uh, bec uh, due to his role in the uh, negotiations that we have talked about already in 1949 that g resulted in the 1950 Nobel Peace Prize. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how this uh, influence of uh, his role as a political scientist uh, was the jump start uh, for everything else. And I wanted to highlight uh, some of his own words from uh, a presidential address that he gave when he was uh, president of the American Political Science Association, which is, um, <clears throat> he was the first African American uh, president of the American Political Science Association, and uh, they are in the room here today, uh, and that is an honor as well. Uh, the, um, uh, in 1954, the year of Brown, he uh, gave the, um, um, the address, uh, 
And I will emphasize from the start, he did not reference Brown versus Board of Education in uh, this address. And he, but he documents uh, that there were only about 25 folks at the first American political science meeting, and that at the time, in mid-1950s, there was about 300 political science departments. Uh, he spent some time praising uh, uh, President Woodrow Wilson, also a political scientist, uh, for his vision that politics need to have scientific rigor, but needs to also solve the problems of common humanity. Uh, and um, he spent a lot of time talking about how, a political, as a political scientist, that was a foundation that mattered to him. So I want to read a quote for you about uh, that he describes what it's like being an academic. And he said this in his uh, presidential address, that th this is not always meant as flattery, uh, that the habit of trying to marshal all the facts, weigh them, and think things through thoroughly as the bands for action is something regarded as droll and at all other times uh, in cases of little, little impatience. And he concludes uh, by saying, you will pardon me, I trust, if I say that to my untheoretical mind, speaking to political scientists, that the real measure of our success or failure as a political scientist is to be found in the manner in which opportunity is served and responsibility discharged. In other words, in our total impact for good or ill upon the society. And he asks a very detailed question, which confirms he's a political scientist because it's five lines long. <laughs> uh, and, and the question uh, reads thusly. Are political scientists still too much attached to abstract formalism, to metaphysical and juristic concepts, to establish patterns and a traditionally narrow scope, and to exclusively to be fully realistic about the political needs, motivations, and forces which stimulate and control the thoughts, actions of citizens and governments, and therefore to be a maximum usefulness in a world of dire distress? And he goes on to finally say that in our analyses as social scientists, in our calculations, in our conclusions concerning political phenomenon, we should never lose sight of the human, what he called the personal factor. And what I, I wanted to begin by that to emphasize that he goes on to talk about that the diplomatic work he was doing was informed uh, by uh, the cool-headedness that he uh, received in training as an academic. And that uh, that type of cool-headedness is what brought him uh, to, he indicated, to be successful actually uh, in that, of course, famous uh, armistice agreement that got him uh, uh, the uh, Nobel Peace Prize Award. And uh, I'll give you another example. He um, also made a key report in 1939, which he's not talked about a lot, in terms of his domestic political agenda that impacted civil rights. He, he was asked by the then Republican National Committee to uh, do a report on African Americans in uh, the United States. And he did so. And this is, of course, keeping context, 19. 39, and uh, what, what he finds in this uh, report um, is that, of course, African Americans are uh, not where they should be, uh, and that the Republican Party at the time was not doing enough to help. And his recommendation to them was this, and I, I wanted to take the time to read it because it, you will hear some strong parallels with what just happened this week. Um, he, his four recommendations, one, he said to the Republican National Committee, if you want to help on African American issues, you should fight for the, quote, enfranchisement of the Negro in the South, uh, i.e. voter suppression or the lack thereof, uh, the protection of the civil rights of the Negro, uh, the enactment of an anti-lynching bill, and the appointment of Negroes to government policy positions. And uh, I know some of you murmured because some of us perhaps watched the news in here and learned that uh, down the street uh, we just passed an anti-lynching bill for the first time in American history this week. And uh, it was Ralph Bunch who first recommended to the Republican National Committee as the first African American to ever be asked to write a report for any major political party. 
Um, and the challenge with the report, though, that it was never published. It wasn't published because, the, as you may imagine, politics got in the way. Democrats wanted to excise out and only report on that which uh, helped them. Same thing for Republicans. Ralph Bunch refused to allow either to publish them. Therefore, the, the, the report still sits to this day uh, in UCLA libraries. Um, I, I want to share that story because it's a story that a lot of people I don't think know about some of the ro roles in which he played in civil rights. And my last point I will make and take some questions um, was that he spoke to the NAACP in 1954, won their Spingard Medal in 49. Uh, he sent a uh, telegram to uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1956, uh, articulating how he really found uh, passion and agreement uh, in the kind of measured way in which he has uh, addressed civil rights issues. And as you were talking about earlier with decolonization, he wrote the decolonization chapters of the original UN Charter. Uh, and worked with uh, Le Eleanor Roosevelt in the drafting, of course, the Human Rights Declaration. He sought permission uh, of the Secretary General to attend and participate and help lead the Selma to Montgomery March, of course, for voting rights and the March on Washington. Um, and he, uh, that was a difficult time for him. Uh, I'll end with this because African Americans um, had mixed views about Ralph Bunch. There were uh, the moderate and the majority mainstream African Americans that found his measured, pragmatic approach to politics and solving issues in black communities to be uh, appropriate. Then there were more leftists, like Stokely Carmichael or Malcolm X, uh, uh, that, that wrote to him uh, in both public letters uh, and in uh, private sessions that they did not believe that he was doing enough. And th I, I end with that because he always wrestled with that uh, and the difficulty of being an international civil servant and not wanting to be viewed uh, as, as someone who is misusing and abusing that re heavy responsibility uh, uh, simply uh, um, um, for the sake um, of occasional opportunities to participate in that which was so important for him. And when he could not participate, he found ways uh, to, to do so behind the scenes, like, for example, uh, in the often unreported uh, work he did in, on behalf of the Republican National Committee, uh, arguing for African American rights as early as 1939. Thank you, Dr. Perry. That was extraordinarily interesting. And I will just ask one question right in uh, the context of what you uh, were describing just now. Uh, Dr. Bunch worked in, he, he didn't work in, in, um, in isolation. Uh, he was part of what was happening on the ground, uh, the political and the uh, social uh, and domestic environment that uh, we all were experiencing during that key period in the 1930s and uh, in the 1940s and, and in the 1950s. How do you think these moments in American history help to shape uh, Dr. Bunch's work? Uh, what was he experiencing at that time that might have uh, uh, directed him in one way or another? So uh, he was, and I appreciate that question, he was uh, very busy, uh, frankly, you know, while, while chairing the Department of Political Science at Howard. Uh, he was also uh, uh, and still completing work uh, at Harvard. Uh, he was also uh, beginning uh, his, some of his diplomatic work in DC. Uh, and, and on top of that, was asked to participate in a lot of uh, civil rights activity in both local and kind of national efforts. And so you can imagine how he felt pulled in many, many, many directions. Uh, but it, it really was, uh, at least some, many, many of his writings and personal letters to friends indicate, he was very much uh, invested uh, morally uh, and personally in the advancement of black rights in the United States. Um, and and the, the opportunities that the 40s and 50s, particularly with some legal cases, um, um, uh, uh, provided f as in terms of the platform for him to then at discuss the importance of these issues um, became uh, resonant. I remember also reading where he talked about how the advent, of course, of television was helpful uh, in the late 60s, and that uh, finally the, the stories of abuse toward African Americans uh, was able to be shown and seen broadcast across the world, which in some ways made it a bit easier. 
uh, 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 for uh, folks uh, outside this country to understand the plight um, of African Americans. Uh, but ultimately, uh, he was an, a, a black political scientist uh, who tried to solve the needs of everyday people, um, like from the city of Detroit where he's from. And uh, one example of this uh, is another line that he uh, read and reported in the Republican National Committee report where he said, the Negro is in need of everything that a constructive human American political program can give him. Employment, land, housing, relief, health protection, unemployment, old age insurance, enjoyment of civil rights, all that a 20th century citizen is entitled to. And, that, and so I, I would address that question by saying his travels and expertise and the opportunities to change the world stage was largely influenced by the fact, as one of the quotes said in one of his uh, documentaries, that he did not want to uh, leave the UN and then come back to Jim Crow, DC. Oh, great ending. Finally, we will hear from Dr. Bunch's namesake and grandson, Ralph Bunch III. Mr. Bunch is the General Secretary at the Brussels-based nonprofit Unrepresented Nations and Peoples Organization. Mr. Bunch. Thank you, Ambassador. And, and I just want to say on behalf of the family, um, thank you to everybody who's been involved in this. Um, the, the Foreign Service Institute, the, the, the initiative around the heroes of U.S. diplomacy, um, and all of the institutes that are out there that are trying to keep his name and, 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 and lessons alive. That includes the UCLA, includes Howard University, who includes the City University of New York, the, the State Department's library. Um, so many institutions trying to keep um, his, his, his legacy alive, and I think it's incredibly important. And as the family uh, would, would like me just to convey that message of thanks to everybody. Um, I, I don't have, I'm not an expert in the, in the, in the way that Dr. Perry and Dr. Um, well, Cal, I'm, I'm, I always struggle with your name, just to call you Cal, Cal. Um, <laughs> I, 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 you know, the, the, the way that they, they, that they are in the, the studying of his life. I, I, I want to talk just a little bit about, um, I never met my grandfather, it's important to say, but a lot of his legacy sort of is embedded in what we are as a family and who we are as people um, in our family. And I wanted to talk a little bit about some of those lessons that have come down to me um, as a result of his life, um, and, 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 and specifically focus on ones that I think are relevant for today. Uh, and, and just to say, I mean, in the, the, there are a few core aspects of who we are as a family, who I think we all are as people in our family, how we see the world, that have come down from him. And in many ways, actually, not just from him, but from, from his grandmother. He, he uh, uh, was effectively orphaned at a very young age. Um, his, his, his mother died, his father left, and he was with his grandmother. And his grandmother was really the, the, the driver of his life and, and, and how he saw the world and how he went ahead with it. And, and, and the focus of that was education. Education was, I think, the most important thing um, that he sees for the advancement of peoples generally. Um, and it was, it was it's a key part of our life, actually, as a, as a family. And, and working, working, and working around education is a big thing. My, my father, who had the big shoes, I mean, you can hear my, my, my accent is, is, is very British. I, I grew up in, in, in England, um, so I didn't have the, uh, the, 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 the big shadow to grow up in, actually, Ambassador. My father did. And uh, oftentimes, that was around education. Oftentimes that was around phone calls at, uh, late at night on a Saturday asking him, why were you not at your desk working? Why were you not studying? Because studying was everything in our family. And that came from his grandmother, actually. At, 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 at some points in time, he had, he had, he had questioned, um, after he was effectively orphaned, questioned whether or not he should be engaging in education, to keep going, or whether he should be working for the family. And it was his grandmother who, that pushed him through it. And it was the universities that did it for him. It was the universities that made his career. It was UCLA, it was Howard, it was Harvard. This is, this is what brought him to being where, we, where he is and where we are as a family. And I think that one aspect, which is not incredibly relevant to the heroes of diplomacy, but it's the, the one feature of our family that is always there that I wanted to get across. The other, which I think is very relevant to the heroes of diplomacy, is, is to think about was it, how, uh, how accidental a diplomat he was. 
So to a certain extent, we, we lose him as a family, actually, when he becomes this, 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 this great international diplomat at the United Nations. He goes off to um, international civil service. And, and to a certain extent, actually, the family history and what we know about him disappears to a certain extent as he disappears into that life. But we know a lot more about what it was up to that period of time. And, and thinking about that and thinking about how he got to where he got to, um, you, you realize how accidental it was, and I think he would, I think, I think he would actually say that. You, you, Cal may have found some stuff in his writings about that. But you, 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 could, you could see that he didn't intend to be where he was. He was working at the on the issue that was in front of him, and the issue in front of him that mattered to him was, was the situation of African Americans in the United States. And that led him into academic research to look at the effect on colonization on subjected people, um, subjugated people around the world. That led him into looking at the, the civil rights movement in the United States in an internationalist outlook, to looking at the world as a, as a, as a whole and not at uh, you know, the, the sort of idiosyncrasies of what's happening in the United States in one place. And he was incredibly accidental as a diplomat in the sense that he was only in the, the Foreign Service for a very short period of time at the State Department, for a very short period of time. He didn't intend to become part of the United Nations at the, be you know, at the beginning of his career because obviously there wasn't a United Nations. And it was all kind of accidental. He just kind of got to where he got to. And, and what's really interesting about that with the heroes of the US diplomacy, if you've been engaged in some of the other um, uh, sessions that they've had, I think this is the fourth, many of the people that, you're, that, that have been feted are not people who are career foreign service people. It's a, it's, it's, it's a sense of, of different people engaging in, in, in diplomacy for the United States in a very, very different way. Citizens engaging, professionals engaging in a very different way. And I think that's part of what you can think about with this career. Why is it important that the State Department is fetting a hero of US diplomacy who spent only a, you know, a short period of his life in the State Department? And it's because we, we are all, we are all, all of us working internationally are in some ways or others diplomats for the United States. And, and it's an incredibly important lesson. And I think that's just another one that has always been part of, of, of sort of the family law and the things that I've, I've always sort of embedded in myself. And the final thing, and I think, Dr. Perry, you really got at it, um, is that, and the final lesson, which has always been an incredibly important thing, has always been something that we've always learned about, and this is from the period at the United Nations, was the value of an independent civil service, of a neutral civil service. He was a firm believer in this, and, in, and embedding that into the United Nations was an incredibly important part of his life and his career. And if, if, if we think about the stories <coughs> that we hear in our family about that period of time, what we hear are the struggles, the internal struggles of how to, to deal with these issues of, of segregation, of, of, of race relations in the United States, of the Vietnam War. And when my father was sent to the Vietnam War, he was not happy about it, he was not happy about the war. How do you deal with those things in a position where you're a very famous public servant, but you are also an inter international civil servant? And, and to a certain extent, he made decisions to stay more neutral than I think he would have liked to have. And that has led to some of those, 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 those questions about, his, about, about where he stands in the sort of the history of the, of the civil rights movement. But he was very much engaged in it before the United Nations. He was a leader in it before the United Nations. And, and this is incredibly important. I think for this meeting, it's one that I, I, I think is important to take away because I'm certain that each and every one of you in this room are engaged with that struggle yourselves. And at some point in your careers, you're, you're dealing with that struggle of wanting to engage more in the domestic affairs of, of, of the United States, but not being able to because of your, your, your role. And, and I think it's important that you, that you understand, and I think that's the lesson that I take from his life, that that, that isn't a failure on your part to so not engage, actually. It's a success to be able to deal with that internal tension and, and to maintain your neutrality in, 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 your, in your roles, I think is an incredibly difficult thing to do, and it's one that should be celebrated. And, and, and for me, that, those are the sort of the, the main lessons I would take from his life for today, and, and I, I'm so glad to have the opportunity to talk about it. So thank you for everyone who's putting it on. Thank you, Ralph. <clears throat> I just have one question for you, and and uh, it's rather personal, so you can tell me if you, you don't want to answer it. You, you bear yeah. the name of, of your, uh, your grandfather. Uh, it carries with it heavy obligations and responsibilities, and I would even argue burdens of having that name. Can you share with us some of your experiences where you've had to deal with being the grandson of Dr. Ralph Bunch? 
I, I, they, I certainly can, and, it's, um, and it is one. I mean, it's one that my father dealt with in his life as well. It's very difficult. Uh, so at the beginning, I'll just tell you one. I, I, I'm a lawyer. I'm a U.S. attorney I, um, by trade. I, I now work in this sort of human rights world, but um, I, I'm a lawyer. My, my father gave me a plaque when I, when I graduated law school, uh, and uh, it had a quote, and it said, and the quote was from my grandfather, it said, eloquent arguments for that which is just and that which is right, um, which right and which is just, are not the sole prever- preserve of those who pass through the hallowed halls of law schools. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> some, and, and, uh, and Cal sent me a number of other writings about this. He hated lawyers. <laughs> We're horrible. I mean, we are really horrible. We get too, too caught up in the law, what's on the text. And um, actually, this was, I think, the key lesson. My father's a smart man, and he did a, he did a good job giving this to me at, the, at that time. You, you know, you go through law school, you come out, you're so arrogant, you think you know everything, and you're the greatest person because you're just this lawyer, and it's amazing. And uh, to get slapped in the face with that <laughs> early on was really great. And, and actually, it's been really useful. I, it's been useful. I, I, I do a lot of work with young lawyers. I've mentored you know, young lawyers for, throughout my career. And, and it's one of the most important things to tell them. And actually, it goes to what Dr. Perry talked about as well, the focus on the human. Um, it, it's been so important for me to understand that and to know that, uh, to, to make sure that whenever I'm doing my work, I look more at the human than at the text. Um, and, and, and that is actually a, a really key lesson for me. That's the positive one. Um, the, the, the other stuff is, I mean, there's lots of it. So it, it, it's impossible for me to live up to, the, to, the, to his history. To, to a certain extent, I find it impossible to live up to, to what my father did. He wouldn't do this at all. He was a banker, but he was a successful one. And I find it very difficult to sort of live up to the history of, 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 of you know, my predecessors and having the name is difficult in that sense. Um, and, and it's always there, I, I will say. I, I try to, to forget about it, but it is always there. Um, it's always there to thinking, well, are you doing the right thing? Um, you know, is, is this really what you've been put here for, or are you wasting your time on the planet because, because the, you know, the other people so close to you have, have done something so important? So it, it, it is always there. Um, and then sort of practically, in the work that I do now, so, so my organization works now on, for want of a better word, the, the um, post-colonial world and looks at different types of colonial structures that continue to exist in this world. Um, and I, my, my organization is a membership-based organization of uh, people seeking the right to self-determination from all over the world. Uh, and I get faced with situations where people are actually not so happy with the solutions that, were, that came out of the Trusteeship Council. Um, I deal with it on a daily basis, actually. Uh, and it, it's always important, I think, to remember what, what Cal was talking about, which is so much of what they were doing at the United Nations was patching you know, a, a messy world and not trying to necessarily find the actual end solution to anything, but they were tr- sort of patching it. Uh, and that's a big thing for me, and, 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 and to try and remember that and, and, and not to get too involved in sort of the history of the family is, 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 a, is, is a big part of what I do. And I always stay away from Israel Palestine in what I do because <laughs> it's too complicated and it becomes very personal and complicated. So I, I just stay away. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ralph. Let's give our, our uh, panel a hand of applause. So I know we just have a few minutes left. Uh, and uh, I, But I know that many of you have questions, so why don't I open it up for uh, uh, Q&As. We have microphones on both sides of the room. Uh, so if you have a question, uh, go to one of the microphones and then let me know who you are directing your question to. All right. <laughs> sure question. I love the, hello, I'm sorry. Ambassador Greenfield, notice I didn't follow directions. Tommy Grant, <laughs> State Department, also president of the Civil Service Association. I love the constant referral to international civil servant. I love the fact that Dr. Bush is, or was, uh, still is through his words, an educator. So here's my question. I wish we would go beyond the classroom, beyond the neighborhood, and really put forth his vision of being an international civil servant. All of us can be international civil servants. And in that way, how can, how can we get there so that there will be peace instead of the, the leaders who 
perhaps are anti-peace, and we can understand that I'm not alone, that someone in country X feels the same way I do, that we, we all want that same thing. That as long as we can get that international civil service, civil servant m motto out there, I think we'd be better off. But thank you for that, for mentioning that so much. Good, thank you. Anyone like to tackle uh, a, a response? I think it was more a comment, uh, and a comment that we all should take to, to heart. Uh, and I will just say in response to that, that when we talk about international affairs and careers in international affairs, and while we're in the State Department, those careers are also in the United Nations, and to encourage young people to look at those careers as well. Yes. And Ambassador, could I just do a yeah. quick plug as well for um, the Ralph Bunch Center at Howard University do, do, does a lot of work on trying to encourage minority participation in the civil service, in the foreign service in particular in, in, in the United States. And uh, I just, that's, uh, just a plug for that, it's an incredibly important thing. Um, it's really important to us as a family um, and any support that can be given to that initiative, of, of those initiatives to get more minorities in the civil service and the foreign service um, would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, we, we send dozens of students a year. We would rather send thousands. Good. My name is Jim Dandridge, and I would like to, on behalf of Ralph Bunch, closest professional colleague, friend, biographer, and successor as a UN undersecretary, uh, Sir Brian Urquhart, who will um, celebrate his 101st birthday two days hence on February the 29th. He was born in a leap year and this is a leap year. <laughs> and he has asked me to first thank the Department of State, thank the museum, and to thank the panel for carrying on an effort that uh, he was involved in 16 years ago when we were celebrating the centenary mm -hmm. of the legacy of Dr. Bunch. And uh, he is very, very proud of the fact that that initiative that he started with then a filmmaker, William Greaves, who did a film documentary version of the uh, book that uh, Sir Brian Urquhart uh, penned um, on behalf of uh, Dr. Bunch's uh, contributions to international human rights. And I would like to just tag in and also say thank you very much to the museum and to the panel for sharing your expertise on the knowledge of this great hero, not only as uh, Ralph the third has mentioned this international hero who has made significant contributions to the preservation of international human rights. Thank you. Next, yes. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Julian Goldstein. I am a junior international relations major hailing from Washington, D.C., uh, currently attending Howard University most recently a delegate to the uh, Friendship Ambassadors uh, Youth Assembly just held at Hunter College in New York, um, where we commemorated a lot of the achievements uh, around international collaboration and bringing youth actors to the table uh, in impactful ways and conversations. Uh, currently, I uh, am an activist around the Washington, D.C. statehood movement um, who is sought to lobby in get uh, members of Congress to support the bill. Uh, the statehood uh, issue is actually a member of the United, uh, the, the UNPO organization. Uh, my question is uh, in regards to ongoing challenges that uh, were first outlined uh, more than half a century ago by Dr. Bunch and where the current generation of uh, policymakers, uh, citizenry, as well as media play into uh, pushing forward those issues today. Who, who would like to take that? Um, so I, I will start by saying I don't think that we do enough uh, with uh, one as citizens. I'll begin with that um, in terms of advancing uh, human rights. Uh, one of the main contributions 
of many that we've discussed of uh, Ralph Bunch uh, was the fact that he helped uh, civil rights activists understand uh, that what they were fighting for here locally, domestically, regionally was really part of a broader human rights narrative. Uh, and he also helped un human rights internationalists understand that what they were fighting for uh, had very lived local uh, implications uh, on everyday lives. And so that, that was uh, the role that he played, and I emphasize that he did that, he did that as a private citizen. Right, and again, as a political scientist, as a social scientist, someone who he, he um, all, some, some, someone who decided to use his own private time to make lives better for other people. I don't think we do enough of that today, frankly, as individuals. And, and w our research in political science says that, that there's been a decrease in uh, civic and political participation of Americans uh, in their government. And uh, some of us have seen the perils of that uh, lack of participation. In terms of media, uh, the media doesn't, I, I, media has just changed, obviously, in the last five minutes, let, let alone the last five <laughs> decades. Uh, and so I, I think one of the challenges that we all have is to, uh, is to make sure that we, we select uh, uh, carefully what we choose to watch and that the information that we claim to learn from the sources that we self-select, that we vet those sources. It's kind of like our Christmas list. We check it twice uh, <laughs> before sharing it. Uh, and that because we are all responsible for ensuring that the accurate information is shared uh, related to international issues, and this is particularly important for African Americans. African Americans were the primary group targeted by Russia uh, in the last election as determined by the GOP-led Senate Intelligence Report from last fall um, and in terms of interfering in this election. Uh, that is an international affairs issue. Uh, that is a cyber crime. Uh, and that directly impacts African Americans and human beings, seemingly all of the issues that Ralph Bunch fought his life for. And so I think it's our responsibility now to certainly ensure that uh, we are doing all that we can uh, to not only respect the legacy and make sure that it lives on, but to help continue to implement it in our own daily lives. Thank you, Dr. Perry. I see two more people standing, and so these will be our two last questions, and I will take them both, and then we'll decide who to should answer. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexandra Maloney. I'm here. I'm a recent graduate representing Morgan State University and Cornell University. So thank you all so much for hosting this event and sharing all of this really phenomenal, valuable information, particularly for me as someone who's interested in entering the foreign affairs field. So my question to you all, I recently read a study from the GAO that discusses um, diversity and inclusion, specifically in the State Department, and how numbers now are less for women and ethnic minorities in terms of employment than they were in the past. So as I'm reflecting on just this legacy from um, Ambassador Ralph Bunch, what do you all see that the areas of opportunities for the State Department to continue to build their, this diverse workforce and diverse capacity? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Hello, my name is Cameron Vega. I'm an intern at the Office of United Nations Political Affairs, an undergraduate hailing from Arizona State University. Uh, my question is primarily directed at Mr. Ralph Bunch III um, on how we can move the issues of self-determination and statelessness outside of the area of great power politics. Thank you. Uh, who would like to address the first question? You oh, I knew. <laughs> I knew that's what. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I read the GAO report as well. And uh, what that report says to me is the work of diversity and inclusion is not a, it's, it's not a goal that ends. It is something that has to be uh, continuous. Uh, when I came into the State Department in 1982, uh, the State Department was fighting two class action uh, suits, the women's class action suit, Palmer, and the Thomas class action uh, suit uh, for uh, uh, black Americans. Those suits were eventually settled sometime around the mid 80s, I think around 80, 85, 86, those suits were settled. And we all uh, patted ourselves on the back and thought that we had achieved something. Yet, 
over the next 30 years of my career, we were constantly bringing back the issue that we needed more diversity uh, in the State Department. We needed more diversity in the Foreign Service. Uh, we needed more diversity in international affairs. And so it is work that is nonstop. If you accomplish it and you stop, then you find that you go backward. And that's what that GAO report has said to us. Not only did we not complete what we were doing, we've actually gotten worse. And uh, it does uh, mean that we have to redouble our efforts. Uh, and it is uh, work that everybody has to be involved in. It is not the responsibility of women, of African Americans, to ensure that the State Department looks like them. It is the responsibility of the State Department, of management, and of every single person here to ensure that we have a State Department that represents the face of America. So. Well. I think uh, we have uh, run out of time. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm That's sorry. OK. I, 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 to a certain extent, I'm going to punt it to a conversation <laughs> that we'll have afterwards. So, so let's just talk about it um, separately, because it, it gets a little bit into me and le less into my grandfather. So I think important to talk about it. But one thing just that I think is important that we haven't talked too much about, but I want to raise, is not only that he was an academic, my grandfather, but he was a social scientist. And he was a social scientist at a time where this was a new discipline, a brand new discipline and a brand new way of looking at the world. And one of the things that led him into looking at colonialism and looking at trying to reform the international structures was looking at the sort of psychosocial, however you want to put it, impact of power structures on dominated people. So he's looking at those things and, 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 and trying to understand how you can create systems that, that, that free people from those power structures. And I think, you know, I will answer that question to you afterwards and more privately, but, but the one thing that I will say is that it's important, and I think one of the parts of his legacy that's important to recognize, is that we need to always be looking at our power structures. What are the, the structures that we're living in in the world today, domestically and internationally, and looking at those power structures and to see whether or not they are best, uh, best suited to liberating people and to freedom. Thank and, you. And this has been an extraordinarily uh, illuminating and interesting uh, conversation that we've had today. And I'd like to just close with a couple very uh, short uh, observations. First, it's clear that Dr. Bunch was an important figure in his day on multiple fronts. Uh, he sought liberation at home as well as abroad. Uh, he broke down racial barriers. Uh, not only in the context of the civil rights movement, but also for the U.S. and its relations with world challenges. And as a career foreign service officer, I just want to say to you, Raf, we really admired uh, your grandfather. Thank you. And uh, we have appreciated uh, the legacy that he has left for us. Uh, and I hope that the next generation is aware of this great man as they move forward to pursue their careers, because he really is someone that they should be working to emulate in their own careers. So thank you very much. I'd like to invite everyone to join uh, us upstairs and take a look at this extraordinary exhibition and some of the artifacts and the photos from uh, uh, Dr. Bunch's life that will help you uh, uh, understand his life story more. So thank you again. I would just also, and I, I'm sorry I did not introduce Dr. Dan Smith, who is head of the Foreign Service Institute, and he and his team, they've done a wonderful job with this Heroes yeah. of Diplomacy. And we do actually have one of our heroes among us with um, Lizzie Slater sitting here in the front row. So. And please, let's give another round of applause to our panel here. And hopefully with the building of this museum, we can actually encourage more diversity out here in the um, Foreign Service. And please, come by, come and see us, or refer student groups to come and see us. We actually have a diplomatic simulation program we do with all ages here at the National Museum of American Diplomacy. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.